Chapter 11 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 11 the two-valved shells the beautiful objects which we know as shells and which form ornaments in many a home far distant from the sea are the coverings of a group of animals called mollusks they are found in all seas many upon land and in freshwater streams and are among the most attractive of all natural objects so much so that many persons devote their entire lives to their collection and many others much time to the study of their habits it is rare to find a new shell so well have these shell hunters searched the waters of the world such collections especially if complete are very valuable and many of the great museums have paid thousands of dollars for them the mollusks or shells present a striking contrast to the worms they have no joints are soft seemingly without form and are very helpless creatures the body is enveloped in a muscular coat or mantle as shown in the oyster they have a nervous system and a heart which pumps colorless blood some have a foot for locomotion and eyes more or less well developed the oyster represents a large group which have two shells called bivalves in figure eighty we see the animal portion of the common snail which illustrates another group with but one shell these are called univalves to the bivalves belong the shells best known the oysters clams scallops pectins pearl oyster razor shell and many others of which the oyster is the most familiar the mantle the soft delicate lining is the shell maker and not only forms it but repairs damages to it piling up layer after layer of pearly matter called nacre as there is a mantle on each side two valves are secreted the sharp portion of the oyster is called the beak here the growth of the shell begins and here are the marvelous valves which fit with such accuracy these complicated parts are easily seen in the clam the hinge is joined by teeth which fit into cavities on the opposite valve while the valves are held together by a perfect hinge a horny ligament that tends to open the shell or throw the valves apart in the interior of all shells are seen certain scars in others a purple mark these marks indicate the location of a strong muscle by which the clam or oyster closes its shells and keeps them closed with such rigidity in opening oysters the man severs this muscle and the shell opens forced apart by its ligament this explains why most shells found on the beach are wide open the curious columnar objects in rows are the gills or breathing organs of the oyster and are covered with little oars or cilia which move to and fro continually sweeping the currents of water along bearing oxygen and food the former is taken up by the gills to purify the blood and the latter is swept into the mouth located near the lungs there is great variety in the hearts of shells in the oyster it is composed of one auricle and one ventricle but in other shells the heart may be three-chambered 
or there may be two distinct hearts each having two chambers the eyes of the shells are very minute and are situated along the mantle those of the pecten are very beautiful and are distinctly visible resembling gems or emeralds the clams differ from the oysters in having a pronounced foot which protrudes from the large end of the shell and with it the animal digs its burrow it also hears indirectly by its foot as its ears are in this organ little transparent sacs containing a clear fluid in which floats a glassy globule the clam also has a siphon which in the common clam is very long it has a black head or tip and the clam may rest some distance down in its hole and take in water through its siphon which is double barreled one opening receives water containing food and oxygen the other expels the water in strolling along the sands at low tide one often sees a spurt of water shoot out of a hole and may assume that a clam has been alarmed and has retracted its siphon so suddenly that it has shot a stream of water above the surface the shells increase by eggs the oyster depositing a vast number which at first are curious little free swimming objects paddling by the aid of cilia or whips but soon attaching themselves to the bottom and taking the oyster form the oyster is perhaps the most valuable bivalve to man being a favorite article of food for which one million five hundred thousand dollars is paid annually in new york alone thousands of men find employment collecting them in various parts of the world in this country the most valuable oyster beds are in the vicinity of new york at the mouth of the shrewsbury river in the chesapeake bay and at various points along shore to florida where there are large banks at the mouths of the rivers in watching the excavation of a cellar at the town of mayport at the mouth of the st john river i saw oyster shells thrown up as deep as the men went the town is built on an ancient oyster bed among the old shells numerous pieces of pottery have been found showing that the early natives frequented the spot the living oyster bed here today is some distance out in the stream when sailing up a small river in maine some years ago i found about ten miles from its mouth a mound of oyster shells thirty or forty feet high the river appeared to have cut the bed in two and out of the top of the mound which was of solid shells grew a tree which must have been a century old i believe there are no oysters on the main coast today and the great pile was accumulated ages ago when maine had oyster beds and the indians carried the oysters ten miles up the river to this spot which must have been the site of an ancient indian town or city the pearl oyster is another valuable shell it is common in warmer waters near la paz in the gulf of california is a famous fishery which is owned by the government and farmed out in ceylon it is estimated that seventeen million oysters are destroyed to obtain eighty thousand dollars worth of pearls the shells are also very valuable being made into buttons and various other objects liverpool is the great receiving port for these and many tons are used annually in diving for pearls the ceylonese who are able to remain beneath the water several minutes place as many shells as possible in a basket and then ascend leaving the crew to haul the basket up 
in lower california many divers of today go down in armor pearls are generally valued according to their symmetry and color some are perfect and when of large size bring vast sums one of the shahs of persia owned a necklace in which the pearls were perfect and as large as hazelnuts the pearl is the result of the oyster's attempts to protect itself from injury if we should take one of these beautiful pearl oysters and with a gimlet bore a hole through the shell from the outside and replace it in the water we should find months later if the oyster was examined that it had by using its mantle secreted a large amount of pearly nacre over the wound not only filling up the hole but heaping the pearly secretion over it until a projection a quarter of an inch high was the result resembling a pearl attached to the shell this is the way imperfect pearls are formed they are the attempts on the part of the oyster to prevent injury to itself occasionally some foreign body like a grain of sand will enter the shell its sharp edges will cut the soft flesh of the delicate creature which immediately covers it with pearly nacre the larger it grows the more the oyster notices it among its folds and the more it instinctively covers it with pearl in this way the pearls grow the seed pearls are those in which some impurity has been covered but a few times while the very large pearls are those which have been bathed in nacre time and again if a large pearl is cut in halves the various layers can be counted the sections recalling the interior of an onion the skillful native fakers of the east take advantage of this industry of the pearl oyster to introduce metal beads and figures of the buddha into shells which are then marked the objects finally become covered when they are removed from the shells and sold to the unsuspecting natives as miracles one of the interesting shells of the seashore is the pinna i have found the shores of the outside islands of texas scattered with them they are also called fan shells and are attached to the bottom by a peculiar cable or byssus formed of a silk-like substance which has been woven gloves and hose of pinna silk may be seen in the british museum the pectins are common forms famous for the beautiful gem-like eyes seen along the edge of their mantles i once kept a number of these shells in an aquarium and they were a source of much amusement from their habit of dancing generally they lay in the sand in the bottom of the tank with their valves open an inch or more their bright eyes gleaming without any warning one would open and close its valves with great rapidity which would cause the shell to take convulsive and bounding hops then another shell would follow and soon all of the pectins were leaping up and down in a most extraordinary dance the pectin changes its position or travels not by pushing itself along but by a sudden and spasmodic hop clearing a foot or more the locomotion of shells itself is a fascinating subject an interesting instance is observed in the common mussel this shell has a remarkable foot a pointed fleshy organ which can be protruded with this organ the mussel bores holes in the sand jerks itself along or clears the surface with a bound but its most remarkable service is in aiding the mussel to climb in the foot near its base is a gland which secretes a peculiar substance which when exposed to the water hardens and resembles silk the resemblance is so perfect 
that the silk has been woven into various articles and an attempt was made in france to raise muscles for this purpose when the animal desires to climb it reaches out its foot as high as it can and presses it upon the pile or rock whereupon a delicate cord one of the cables of its byssus is seen again the foot is extended again a cable is attached the entire operation calling to mind the action of a spider each step raises the muscle a little higher and as it moves on the cables that would hold it back are broken off and the muscle at length reaches the position it desires the freshwater mussels found in the ohio and other rivers and streams are pearl producers very valuable gems have been taken from them in various states and the freshwater pearl fishery of the united states is of considerable importance a freshwater pearl found in new jersey was valued at two thousand dollars and one taken from a stream in scotland brought fifty thousand dollars the vast number of shells and the varieties of each can hardly be realized by those who have not examined a well-equipped collection over four thousand species of the mussel are known and hundreds of species of almost every shell exist in various streams and seas the shells range from minute specimens hardly visible two giants weighing several hundred pounds one of the latter being the huge clam tridacna found in the equatorial pacific there are several species and in the largest each valve weighs about two hundred and fifty pounds the animal itself weighs thirty pounds and affords a meal to forty or fifty men the shell by means of its foot buries itself in the soft rock of the regions in which it lives with its valves partly open it resembles a huge sea anemone but it closes them at the slightest alarm large fishes and even natives it is said have been trapped by this giant whose jaw-like valves with three huge teeth grip the fin of a fish or the foot of an unfortunate wader with a vice-like grasp the byssus or anchor of this huge shell is so thick and tenacious that it is severed only with great difficulty and labor the shells are valuable as ornaments large numbers being sent to various countries for this purpose the giant never moves and in this respect is a sharp contrast to the little donax so common on our various shores and in france which leaps along the muddy flats by convulsive movements of its fleshy foot the common razor clam of which sixty or more species are known by means of its foot digs a deep burrow which is filled with water even at low tide the shell is often found at the entrance but at the slightest alarm it dashes deep down into its den to be caught only by persistent digging the odd shapes assumed by many bivalves is well illustrated in the hammer oyster and the folas the latter illustrates the power of the most insignificant animals as by means of its foot this little shell burrows into the hardest granite it is invariably found there and imprisoned for when it reaches the interior of a stone it grows and enlarges leaving but a small opening for the siphons it is supposed by some that the folas possess some secretions by which it dissolves the stone and by others that it wears away the rock by using its shell as a file in any event the shell is known to contain aragonite a very hard substance in the pillar of the temple of serapis italy the holes made by this shell are seen 
perhaps the most remarkable feature of the folas is its power as a light giver it emits a delicate blue light dead or alive one placed in a glass of milk has been used as a lamp illuminating the faces near it another placed in honey retained its phosphorescence for over a year the little folus is found all over the world more than eighty different species being known the teredo or shipworm is called a worm because it secretes a limey shell but it is really a bivalve shell open at both ends a shell which with one exception causes more destruction than all other marine animals combined instinctively it bores into wood forming an irregular tunnel and lining it with a delicate coating of carbonate of lime some years ago i visited on the outer florida reef an old wreck which was newly buried in the sand and partly exposed at low tide the timbers of the vessel looked strong and able to stand many a storm yet with a blow of my hand i broke through the planking the interior was completely honeycombed by the teredo so that it was a maze of tubes at this place the life of a pile of yellow pine was a year and a half in other words after being exposed to the teredo for this length of time it was useless on the pacific at avalon bay the piles last about two years being rapidly destroyed even though soaked in various poisonous fluids and coated with tar many thousands of dollars have been expended in experiments with devices to outwit the teredo but without avail and they are the greatest menace to navigation and piers today making their way into hulls despite the copper sheathing in the mud banks of the waters of sumatra teredos are found which attain a length of six feet with tubes four inches in diameter the shells are famous for their beauty the polished valves in their marvelous tints presenting attractive combinations the common mactra the cockle with its deep radiations the gorgeous pectens of the south the splendid pearl bearing shells all tell a wonderful story of the resources of nature and emphasize the fact that the smallest and most inconspicuous animals vie with the larger forms in beauty of shape and color end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of half hours with the lower animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana half hours with the lower animals by charles holder chapter twelve the univalves the shells which have been noticed in the preceding chapter belonged literally to the stay-at-homes of the family they rarely wander far and many as we have seen never leave the place which the young shell first selected as its home what are known as the univalves the mollusks with one shell or perhaps no shell at all are the reverse of this being in many instances travelers wandering here and there this suggests that they have more highly organized locomotive organs those shown on the upper part of figure ninety four are univalves and if we make a section of a univalve we see that the shell is much more complicated than in the previous forms the univalve has a shell secreting mantle 
and organs resembling those of bivalves only differently placed this marvelous mantle performs some singular feats judging from the spines found on many shells to make these the mantle must have been thrown outward and upward forming a tube in which the spine was secreted in the univalves a distinct head is seen with tentacles and prominent eyes the foot is now elaborated into a huge sucking clinging disc-like organ in the whelk it is as long as the shell the latter being perched high above it presenting a remarkable spectacle as it moves along the sandy floor of the ocean on the head are two tentacles feelers or sense organs and sometimes the eyes are mounted on tall stalks that the shell may have a wide range of vision a siphon such as we have seen in the clam is present and extended upward and forward it protrudes from a canal formed in the shell for the purpose and is often very long if the whelk is disturbed it suddenly withdraws its body including the enormous colored foot and if the shell is picked up the entrance is found securely closed by a horny door called the operculum which is attached to the foot this door takes many shapes in the beautiful conch it is saber shaped and is used to dig into the sand or as a lever to force the conch along by a series of jerks in other shells it is apparently made of porcelain hard and highly polished it is well known as the eye stone of popular fancy many of the univalves are flesh eaters preying upon others of their kind they have a remarkable tongue for the purpose in fact the teeth are upon the tongue in saw-like rows the tongue which is called the lingual ribbon is ribbon shaped long and slender and is really a soft pliable saw with which the animal bores into the hardest shells of the helpless clams in strolling along shore a large majority of the dead clam shells found bleaching in the sun where they have been washed by the sea will be seen to contain a circular hole of perfect symmetry this has been made by the boring saw-like tongue of a univalve which after gaining an entrance into the tightly locked shell deliberately sucked it out it is interesting to note the location of this hole which is invariably over the softest and plumpest part of the victim near the lungs showing that the cannibalistic univalve is very clever in its mode of attack while the oyster deposits vast quantities of eggs which float out into the water to be destroyed by other animals many of the univalves protect their eggs in remarkable cases i have often found on the florida reef strings of singular objects which resembled sections of a yellowish cylinder connected by a little cord each section is an egg case or capsule and contains many shells the entire chain being two or three feet in length this becomes tangled in the coral or seaweed and holds the young shells all of which escape through a little door in each section other shells as the whelk deposit their egg cases in heaps or mounds they are soft and sponge-like and are often mistaken for sponges when divested of their shells and cast ashore 
perhaps the best known egg case is that of the common natica which forms a singular object called the sand collar the animal molds this collar out of fine sand with its foot and deposits its eggs in the interior all being cemented or glued together in a solid mass we shall find that certain birds deposit their eggs in the nests of others so saving the wearying process of hatching a certain shell called nasa has a similar habit at times it deposits its eggs on the collar nest of the natica among the myriads of shells which we may select to illustrate the various interesting types shapes and kinds are the chitons their shells are made up of many plates resembling the plates of a hawkbill turtle many live in holes in the rocks and all have a very large sucking disc-like foot which clings to the rocks with great tenacity resembling them somewhat are the limpets these are interesting and beautiful shells especially when polished forming attractive domes marvelously tinted and colored some are called keyhole limpets from the fact that they have a keyhole like opening in the top they range in size from very minute forms to giants a foot in length among the most beautiful of all shells and at the same time the most common in tropic and semi-tropic seas are the abalones they are also called ear shells they have an enormous foot that covers the entire lower surface being a remarkably powerful organ instances have been known where chinese abalone hunters have tried to pry off the shell from a rock with their hands and have had their fingers caught and held as though by a vice the haliotis is very common on the shores of the southern californian islands in some localities every rock is covered with them and in places where the black abalone is common i have found them piled one upon the other there are two hundred species living every tint color or tone known in the scale of color or its combinations is flashed from these marvelous shells which if rare would be counted among the most beautiful of all natural productions on the californian coast they are collected in large numbers and when polished are converted into buttons and a thousand and one other objects the meat which is of excellent quality is sold in large quantities to the chinese thousands of the shells are bought by tourists the outside being richly polished from the ancient graves or indian mounds of the californian islands i have taken quantities especially the large kind known as the red abalone showing that they were used by the ancient inhabitants in all of these islands heaps and piles of abalones are found far from the water by stopping up the holes in the shell with asphaltum which drifts ashore here the natives had an excellent dish or baler they cut the shell into earrings and ornaments of many kinds and most of their fish hooks were evolved from this beautiful shell which also supplied a large proportion of their food on the florida reef the great conches are very common they live on the sandy floor of the lagoons hitching themselves slowly along by their long pointed saber-like operculums this is the conch of commerce in which appears the most delicate of all pink colors and which is the source of the rare pink pearls in the same locality but in deeper water 
is found the queen conch which is cut into medallions and cameos the beautiful cyprii of which many varieties are known are called micromox in florida and cowries elsewhere their luster and natural polish often excite wonder for they commonly live concealed in the rough portions of dead coral branches where they would easily become scratched the cowrie however is protected by a remarkable mantle which covers the entire shell thus keeping its piano-like surface as smooth as a mirror many cowries are beautifully striped some are spotted with dark spots on a white background some are yellow others are red or old gold every tint and color seemingly being employed by nature in painting these gems of the sea few other shells have been so universally esteemed by all nations among certain african tribes they are used as money and not many years ago collections of cowries were made with all the ardor that actuated the tulip collectors thousands of dollars being paid for single shells as the orange cowrie the cone shells represent a beautiful group spotted like leopards striped like the tiger black red yellow some shells are very pointed like the auger shell some have an extraordinarily long projection for the siphon as the spindle shell in some the opening is very small as the cone shells while in others it is immense and protected by a large door-like operculum the bulimus is a famous nest builder boa is interesting from the lightness and delicacy of the shell and its rich neutral browns among the very familiar shells are the land snails common in every garden and raised and sold in france and italy as table delicacies closely allied to them are the slugs which bear upon their backs beneath the skin a delicate scale-like shell on the island of san clemente fifty miles off the coast of california i found an extensive sandy plain which was so thickly strewn with the white bleached snail shells that i could hardly step without crushing several the verger had died and the snails were doubtless killed by the direct rays of the sun these interesting animals are called the pulmonates because they breathe air directly the slugs have many peculiar characteristics if the long tentacles on the short eye stalk are destroyed the snail will reproduce them in winter the snails descend into the ground or hide themselves away literally sealing themselves in their shells by closing the door firmly and there hibernate until spring neither eating nor drinking and hardly breathing during this time if placed in a cold storage box they will remain several years in this state some of the snails of africa are six inches across and the eggs are an inch in length semper found a little snail in the philippines which when caught by the foot or tail throws it off as a lizard jerks off its tail this is not a great hardship as the tail is soon renewed in a collection of shells which came from france some years ago i found several snails of different colors which were joined one to the other the collector had cut the top from an empty brown snail and placed a living snail with a yellow shell upon it tying the two together the snail supposing that its shell had been broken 
immediately began to repair the wound and closed up the breach with its shell secreting mantle so that the two shells became one in floating on the borders of the sargasso sea the vast sea of weeds in the south atlantic i found numbers of a beautiful sea slug which so resembled the weeds in shape and color a rich olive green that it was almost impossible to distinguish it except when very close to the surface they have attractive names as doris tritonia aeolus and aplesia and are among the wonders of the great belts of kelp which surround the continent i once found a slug at santa catalina which was a vivid almost iridescent purple another was yellow but the most interesting was aplesia a giant two feet long which i kept in an aquarium it weighed nearly eight pounds could lengthen itself out to a distance of nearly three feet or contract into a dark olive-hued ball scarcely six inches across it took sea lettuce from my hand eating with avidity and when disturbed emitted a purple ink which filled the water and hid the monster sea hair from view it laid its eggs on the sides of the tank in long chains but if not well fed exhibited a decided cannibalistic tendency devouring its own progeny this animal had an enormous foot by which it crept rapidly along and it invariably protected itself by imitating the color of the bottom upon which it rested one of the most interesting slugs is the onchidium according to the naturalist semper it has upon its back numerous eyes which enable it to see from above it is a mud-loving form common in our new provinces the philippines where the heat is intense and the water warm one of the land slugs limax noctiluca emits light and the eggs of another arion have been noticed to be luminous for nearly two weeks after being deposited nearly all these shells are slow-moving animals but there are others the pteropods which are swimmers the veritable fairy craft of the sea they are housed in shells of dainty structure and moving by singular wing-like fins which give them the name of ocean butterflies they have the property of phosphorescence to a remarkable degree cleodora emits a soft light which gleams through the delicate shell like a light in a lantern in swimming it moves its fins up and down very much like a butterfly so that they touch at the top as delicate and dainty as this little creature is it has a marvelous arrangement for seizing prey each tentacle having about three thousand transparent cylinders each of which contains twenty stalked suckers as there are six tentacles on each sucker cleodora can grasp its prey with three hundred thousand hands equally dainty in its way is the sea snail ianthena a violet shell of great delicacy whose foot develops a raft which resembles a mass of soap bubbles so the violet snail floats upon the surface of tropical and semi-tropical seas i have seen the shores of the keys of the florida reef lined with an undulating ribbon of these shells after a storm when touched they emit a rich violet ink which lasts a long time as a stain a small species of ianthina is found in the winter on the southern californian shores and beneath the attractive float will be found the eggs End of chapter 12
Chapter 13 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 13 The Cuttlefishes In the great libraries of the country will be found books dating back to the last two centuries, many of which contain cuts and descriptions of frightful animals resembling huge spiders, called krakens or devil fishes. They are represented climbing over ships and hauling them down. One is described as so huge that the crew of a vessel landed upon it, not discovering that it was not an island until they had built a fire, when the supposed island, really a kraken, sank beneath them. These are tales of romancers, but it is interesting to know that they are based upon a slight foundation of fact. Devil fishes have been discovered in various seas, which weighed several hundred pounds, and whose length ranged from fifty to seventy or more feet. Such an animal is the giant squid, which is a very timid animal, and though it might overturn a small boat, it is not likely to make the attempt. These animals are called cephalopods, because their feet are attached to the head. In other words, they are head-footed. The typical squid or cuttlefish has a barrel-shaped body and a tail resembling an arrowhead. Its head is separated from the body by a seeming neck and is provided with two immense eyes. Projecting forward are two long slender arms and eight shorter ones, which in the giant squid are from six to ten feet in length. These are armed with peculiar suckers, each of which is extremely powerful. In a specimen six feet long, which I kept for an hour alive in a large tank, some idea of the strength of a squid could be obtained. It fastened its eight arms to the tank, and with all the force I could bring to bear, I was unable to tear them off. Besides the eight short arms, there are two long ones. In a specimen of the giant squid which I handled and measured, the long arms were about 30 feet in length. The ends were enlarged with paddle-like organs and bore a group of suckers. The object of the long arms is to serve as graspers. They are kept near the body, coiled up, and can be shot out with remarkable velocity grasping a fish like two hands with gigantic arms. They haul the prey to the short arms when hundreds of sucking discs hold the victim that is now pressed to the remarkable mouth. This lies between the base of the arms and in color and appearance is almost exactly like the beak of a parrot with the exception that the under bill fits over the upper. These bills almost invariably nip the struggling fish over the vertebra or backbone, severing it at once and ending the struggle. The tongue of the squid is a ribbon with teeth upon it. Such an armament alone is sufficient to attract attention to the animal, but it has still another feature which adds to its interest as a weird and disagreeable creature. The squid has a siphon which terminates in a tube opening beneath the head. Into this an ink bag opens. In swimming, the squid rarely if ever rests upon the bottom, 
but takes in water around the edge of the mantle and ejects it with more or less force from the siphon and thus the squid is driven along tail foremost when alarmed its movements are very rapid if in danger the squid pours an inky secretion which is the sepia of commerce into the siphon and the secretion is swept out into the water in a cloud which spreads rapidly to the confusion of any following enemy the squid has a shell but it is very small and internal it is called the pen and that of some species is the cuttlefish bone of commerce in specimens six or seven feet long taken at santa catalina california the pen was fifteen inches long and glass-like a perfect pen in shape such is this peculiar creature and if we add that it can change its color from very dark brown to almost white adapting it to the color of the bottom over which it rests we can form some idea of one of the strangest of all animals they deposit eggs in clusters the squids range in size from gigantic specimens seventy or more feet in length to the minute crancia which is luminous at times some have no tails some only the suggestion of a tail some have very pointed ones some very broad ones in specimens of the little crancia which i observed the head was very small and the body long in proportion one form appears to have side wing-like fins the large squids live in the deep sea and most of the specimens known have been taken from the deep fjords of newfoundland which appears to be a favorite locality for them they doubtless live everywhere in the deep seas as they are almost invariably found in the stomach of the sperm whale evidently constituting a favorite food of this giant toothed whale the squids live mainly upon fishes and are very skillful in taking them poising like a cat near the bottom creeping upon a school of sardines all the time simulating the color of the bottom and almost invisible but for their large dark eyes standing out then suddenly darting tail first into the school flinging the long arms at the flying fishes and almost always catching one which is dragged up to the parrot-like bill and dismembered in the six and seven foot squids taken at santa catalina the stomachs were filled with seaweed showing that at least some of these animals are vegetarians on all tropical shores is found a beautiful coiled shell the spirula with little pearly septa dividing it i have seen a windrow of these shells a mile long but never found the animal and shell together so easily are they disconnected it is the smallest and the most beautiful of all the cephalopods the familiar devilfish or octopus is another form a bottom lover found among the rocks rarely attempting to swim it has a round bag-like body often covered with soft fleshy spines two fiery green eyes which always seem to emit a baneful light eight sucker-lined arms which can be thrown in any direction and the beak and ink bag noticed in the squid but no pen or shell the octopus lives in dens or crevices in the rocks and ranges in size from specimens a foot or two across to giants with arms having a radial spread of nearly thirty feet these large individuals are found along the pacific coast from california to alaska and when caught 
generally make a desperate struggle for liberty and display a vast amount of strength i once kept a number in a tank which were two or three feet across and when they had grasped firmly it was almost impossible to wrench them from the glass they differed much in temper some would apparently play with my hand tapping it with their tentacles or gripping it gently others would crouch like miniature tigers quivering with rage and with green eyes shining would spring upon it and attempt to smother it with their arms a most disagreeable sensation especially when it was almost impossible to remove the hand from the uncanny grasp without lacerating their flesh one large octopus in this family when it obtained a grip would hold my hand firmly hence i concluded that a specimen thirty feet across similar to those represented by casts in the yale and national museums might easily overcome a man yet the octopus is a very timid animal in the open water i rarely caught them either in florida or california unless they were cornered and they never attempted to bite but i seized one in the coral and it wound about my arm so tightly that I was obliged to wrench away twenty or more pounds of branch coral before I could release it without laceration. When attacked, the octopus changes color with great rapidity, from black to gray, and when enraged, it often has the appearance of a leopard. Then it hurls a cloud of ink into the water and endeavors to slink away under this cover gliding through crevices that would seem entirely too small to admit so large an animal. The octopus swims when forced to do so, using a web-like membrane which is seen to connect the base of the eight arms, or by forcing water from its siphon. These arms, when extended, give the octopus a faint resemblance to an umbrella without a handle, and with very long supports the octopus preys upon very small animals particularly crabs i have lain among the boulders on the shores of the californian islands and watched the octopus hunting they selected the flood tide and crept near the shore moving along slowly on the watch for a species of grapsis very common here a land crab which occasionally enters the water the crabs crept down to the water's edge and often entered and in this moment of incaution were pounced upon by the disagreeable creature so well named the devil fish sometimes they were caught at the very edge a long livid tentacle would come shooting out of the water like a flame and seize the victim Despite its struggles, it was soon hauled in, the octopus immediately covering it with its umbrella-like bag, doubtless bringing its nippers into play. I have seen an octopus dash out of water two or three feet and scramble up the dry rocks with remarkable speed after an escaping crab. At these times, the octopus can be caught by seizing it quickly, but some experience is required before one can grasp a large octopus and retain the hold, so disagreeable is the sensation of the snake-like tentacles winding about hand and arm. The very appearance of the octopus is like a horrible dream, and so intensely repulsive is the animal that in an actual test not one person in fifty who passed a tank containing an octopus with arms a foot long and a hideous striped body could be induced to touch the animal, though assured that it was absolutely harmless and would merely squeeze the hand. While the devilfish is the type of all that is hideous and repulsive in nature, it has a near relative, the paper nautilus, which is a very dainty and beautiful creature. 
it appears to be an octopus which lives in a shell the argonaut as it is called has eight short arms the upper pair being largely developed at their tips forming fan-like or sail-like organs it was formerly believed that these were really sails held aloft to catch the breeze and blow the fairy argonaut along so fixed in the public mind was this erroneous belief that illustrations in various works otherwise correct display the argonaut in this incorrect position the animal is the female which to protect and carry its eggs is provided with a dainty shell which it secretes but is not attached to and would lose were it not for the two large ended tentacles with which it grasps the beak of the shell these arms also bear the shell making and repairing glands the argonaut can crawl upon the rocks at the bottom swim through the water forced along by its siphon stream or float calmly at the surface about nine species are known generally in some tropical waters every year a few are found stranded upon santa catalina island california in many of the fossil deposits are found gigantic shells resembling the wheels of a cart and enormously heavy these are ammonites and ancestors of the nautilus another member of this wonderful family of animals with feet attached to their heads it has a shell of radiant pearl divided like the little spirula by pearly septa or partitions into rooms or chambers all of which surround a small tube called the siphuncle this contains a long fleshy pedicel hence the nautilus is attached to its shell and cannot leave it the shell chambers are filled with gas and the animal has the power to change its specific gravity to float or rise the nautilus forces itself along by a current from its siphon and in a general way resembles others of the group it has no ink bag and his eye is not the striking object seen in the other forms it is merely an elevation bearing a minute hole which leads into the globe of the eye which during the life of the nautilus is filled with water according to dr henson in place of a refracting lens and a cornea the animal has an arrangement for forming an image on the principle of a pinhole camera we might imagine the nautilus easy to capture but it is very timid and rarely caught instead of eight or ten arms the nautilus has ninety-four the shell is a beautiful object when cleaned and polished being a vase of pearl of a chaste and elegant design often copied and in great demand by native artisans who carve and engrave it and mount it in gold and silver the nautilus aside from its beauty is a most interesting animal being the last or almost the last of its race of fifteen hundred species which have lived in former periods of the earth only two are still alive and these in all probability are doomed to extinction end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 14 The Crustaceans. Among all the animals, few are more interesting and whimsical than the crabs and lobsters. They have jointed legs, feelers, and claws in pairs, living in a shell which they cast like an overcoat when they outgrow it and have bodies which are made up of hard, tough, limey rings or segments. The crustaceans are found in all waters, fresh and salt, and on land. 
They abound in the greatest variety, in range and size from specimens almost invisible to the naked eye, to forms with a radial spread of over 20 feet. During a recent visit to the outlying islands of the Texan coast, I found these extensive regions populated by vast hordes of white and yellowish land crabs, which paraded the beaches and climbed over the dunes in such numbers that the eyes could not be raised without seeing a dozen or more. They were so familiar and tame that several large individuals had burrows by the side of the walk which led from the hotel and readily took bread thrown to them. On the keys of the Florida Reef, the spirit crab, as they are called, are equally common. Pretending to be asleep, I have often watched them cautiously approaching, led by their curiosity to see what strange object this was that had washed ashore. If I remained perfectly quiet, they would gather in dozens, and numbers of little hermits would crawl over me, to drop off at the slightest alarm. In the water were countless other forms. Wherever we go, from the ocean to the interior, we shall find some members of this interesting family. On almost any seashore, we shall find a crab or crayfish, from which some idea of the structure of these animals can be obtained. We see that there are two distinct regions, the head portion and the tail. The first mentioned is hard in one general piece, the latter is made up of joints or rings. Everything about this curious animal is jointed. Turning it over, we see that it has five legs on each side, all jointed. The first pair are large biting claws, and in some species, others are biters. Even the eyes are upon stalks and jointed, and about them are two sets of feelers, whips, or antennae. One large and one small pair, which the animal holds out before it as a blind man does a cane. The mouth is made up of many curious organs for separating and grinding food. Some idea of the various internal organs of the crustaceans may be obtained in figure 131. The breathing organs are conspicuous, curled up like plumes on each side of the crayfish and attached to the base of the legs. Water enters the shell under the edge, back of the great claws, and is swept along over them by a little organ called the gill baler. The gills taking up oxygen from the water, which in turn is absorbed by the colorless blood. The brain is very small, and nerves can be seen passing from it to the various organs. The ears are situated at the base of the small or first antennae, and are little sacs on the upper side containing a thick fluid in which they are floating minute grains of sand. The tail portion is made up of a small number of rings, and is provided with small swimmerettes. At the extreme end are seen five petal-like or fan-like organs, which constitute a most important swimming organ to the lobsters and crayfishes, by the violently flapping of which they dash away backward. In color the crayfish is yellowish-brown or greenish. When alive it presents an attractive appearance. The crustaceans deposit eggs which they carry about with them attached to the swimmerettes and resembling minute branches of grapes. When first hatched, the young crustaceans are totally unlike the parent in appearance, passing through several stages before they reach the adult form. When the crustacean grows too large for its shell, what are known as casting hairs appear on the inner side, which push the shell upward. I have watched this process in the California sea crayfish, and it is generally accomplished at night. The flesh of the animal appears to become very watery and soft at this time. Finally, the animal bursts the shell, and by a slow and convulsive effort, drags the flesh from claws, eyes, swimmerettes, and antennae, and escapes through the upper portion of the division between the head and tail, and presto, we have two animals, one flabby and very nervous, the other the deserted shell, yet seemingly alive. The crayfish is very helpless now and secretes itself for several days until the new skin hardens, when it appears in a freshly colored coat of yellow and black. End of chapter 14、Chapter、15 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 15 From Barnacles to Lobsters. In strolling along the shore, one may often find pieces of wood washed in by the combing waves, which are covered with white and blue tinted objects resembling dates. They have long fleshy stems and appear to have a number of plates or shells, and are by many considered shells. Other floating matter will be found covered with small white objects, and many of the rocks along shore are so completely encrusted by them that the surface of the rock is concealed. On the backs of whales are often found similar objects, often three inches across and two inches high. These are barnacles, cousins of crabs, which secrete multi-valved shells and are anchored to various floating or submerged objects. 
They are crustaceans which are attached to the bottom by their antennae. If the shell of a barnacle is carefully observed, fluffy, feathery objects may be seen coming out with regular motion. These are the feet of the crustacean, which in the barnacles are modified into food catchers, grasping at the minute animals contained in the water. What are called goose barnacles have long stems, and the old writers considered them young geese which grew on trees and finally fell into the water. I have found a goose barnacle in the mouth of a large sunfish, so placed that the barnacle swung clear of the curious teeth of the fish. They are also found on the feathers of penguins in the South Pacific. Every floating timber or wreck at sea is covered with the curious long-stemmed creatures. The barnacles deposit eggs, and the young are at first free swimming, but soon acquire a shell, seek the bottom, or some floating object, and become fixtures for life. Many of the crustaceans are so small that but few persons ever see them, such as cyclops, a minute creature seen distinctly only under a microscope, yet swimming in fresh water and readily recognized by its egg pouches, one on either side of the tail. The eggs hatch out into singular little objects, having very little resemblance to the parent. The cyclops and others are very tenacious of life. When pools and streams dry up and remain so for months, they lie dormant, coming to life again with the return of the water. Many of this group are parasites upon fishes, as the Larinidae, which appear like streamers on the sides of carp and other fishes. These parasites, deeply embedded, live upon the fish. Some of these minute crustaceans are almost exact in their resemblance to shells, as the Steria, which has a bivalve shell. But perhaps the most remarkable creature is Artemis, the brine shrimp, which lives in brine that would be deadly to almost any other animal. A strange experiment has been made with this little creature. Thus, if the brine is very strong, its form resembles A, but if the brine is diluted, it changes to B, a very different animal, so different that it has to be given another name. Many shrimps seem to prefer extreme cold. The apis withstands freezing and hatches readily in the icy water of the far north. This little creature has 47 segments and 120 legs. The fairy shrimp is a dainty and beautiful crustacean with a marvelous array of leaf-like feet which also serve as breathing organs. In the summer, while strolling along shore, one may find that every piece of seaweed or rock, when turned over, affords concealment to myriads of sand fleas, which belong to a group of crustaceans having 14 feet. The sand fleas, true to their name, are remarkable jumpers, darting in all directions and looking very much like an ordinary flea. They are valuable scavengers, eating all kinds of refuse matter. They have the most bizarre shapes, and many, as Arcturus, resemble twigs or pieces of seaweed, extremely difficult to see and doubtless owe their immunity from attack to this cause. This Arcturus is not only a remarkable mimic, but carries its young upon its back. Idotia is a common form about piers, while the little gamorous may be caught with almost every haul of a very fine net. At times, one known as Podoceros builds a singular nest for its better security, and one of the giants of the tribe has eyes so huge that they are made up of facets and entirely cover the head. One of these crustaceans, Limnoria, is among the most destructive of all animals to the work of man. On the Pacific coast they vie with the Teredo, and on the coast of Southern California are the chief aggressors, the life of a prepared pile being less than two years. The little creatures completely perforate it, so that the wood literally falls in pieces, being so closely filled with circular borings that the entire interior of the pile seems to have disappeared. One of the most beautiful of all the crustaceans, in my estimation, is the mantis shrimp, or squilla, which I have kept alive. It is found in deep and shallow water, and is a most remarkable creature both in shape and color. Its head is ornamented with beautifully tinted antennae, vivid blues, greens, and yellows predominating. Its claws are sharp-pointed and deadly weapons when used against its prey. The finlets are richly tinted and in such rapid motion that they appear to be a mass of revolving wheels so that the squilla resembles some strange product of the imagination rather than a living animal. Its young are even more remarkable. One of the best-known groups of crustaceans is represented by those with ten feet, of which the common lobster is a familiar example. In this instance, the first pair of legs are developed into enormous biting claws, yet when the lobster sheds its skin, all the flesh in the large claws is drawn through the very small joint. The lobster is a product of the colder waters of the North Atlantic, not being known on the Pacific Slope, although attempts have been made to introduce it there. 
South of Long Island Sound, it is very rare, and despite the stringent laws for its preservation, is rapidly being exterminated. Lobsters are caught in traps, called lobster pots, which are lowered into kelp and seaweed. Twenty years ago, the annual catch for the state of Maine was nearly 15 million pounds, valued at $250,000. It is far less today. The lobster sometimes attains a weight of 50 pounds, but specimens weighing 4 or 5 pounds are now rare, due to overcatching and the destruction of the undersized young. The color of the animal when alive is a dark green. The familiar red hue is a result of cooking. The eggs of the lobster are laid in March and are masses of green spheres which are carried about by the female attached to her swimmerettes. In southern waters and on the Pacific coast, the place of the lobster is taken by the crayfish, or spiny lobster. The resemblance to the lobster is almost exact with this exception. Instead of large biting claws, the latter are but slightly larger with the ordinary claws ending with a sharp point, while the antennae or feelers are enlarged to an extraordinary degree, becoming highly serrated and defensive organs in every sense. The Florida crayfish is a rich reddish-yellow mottled color, while the California form is a greenish-yellow. On the Florida reef, almost every coral branch or coral head hides a crayfish, the whips being seen waving to and fro. This is their day retreat but at night they wander forth to feed in the luxuriant pastures of algae, or seaweeds, of various kinds found in the lagoons. By going out early in the morning, before sunrise, I have often surprised the crayfishes, the bottom being covered with them, massive fellows weighing eight or ten pounds. They are not so delicate in flavor as the lobster, but are very valuable as bait. The lobster and the Pacific crayfish are both canned, the industry being an important one. The prawns and shrimp are well-known and valuable members of this group, swarming in the same waters and among the most graceful of the tribe. Many are absolutely transparent, the large black eyes alone being seen. The chameleon shrimp is noted for its rapid changes of color, green, brown, and reddish hues following each other over a crystal-like body. In the deeper waters, marvelous shrimps have been found, nearly all dazzling red. Some of the Indian shrimps are giants, two feet in length. In England, horses are employed to catch shrimps. A large dragnet is set in shallow water to which the horse is fastened, the fisherman, mounted, driving the animal over the shallow flats hauling the nets in shore. One of the most interesting of these ten-footed crustaceans is the blind crayfish of Mammoth Cave. It is found also in various subterranean streams of the country. The eye stalk of these little creatures is all that remains to tell the story of what was once an eye, and they live and thrive in perfect darkness. The ordinary crayfish of western streams has a peculiar habit of burrowing, which at times has occasioned great damage in undermining dikes and dams. I once came upon a remarkable crayfish community in Indiana. There had been a flood the day previous, and every log in the neighborhood and the piers of the bridge were covered with crayfish which, in this locality at least, appeared to be endeavoring to escape from too much water. On all sides, some yards from the creek and high above it, the ground was raised in a small heaps, six or eight inches across, each, as I discovered, being the home of a crayfish, and as far as the eye could see on the prairie were these mounds and heaps, suggestive of the vast numbers of these little animals in this vicinity. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder Chapter 16 The Crabs Of all the crustaceans, the crabs are most singular and certainly the most intelligent. Rapid in movement, good swimmers, alert, garbed in extraordinary colors, often in stolen homes, they attract attention at once and are the harlequins and clowns of the animal kingdom. The crabs are distinguished from the rest of the group principally by their very short tails. Their bodies are round, elongated, or oval. They are found almost everywhere, from the deep sea, where they occupy shells and sometimes drag about a luminous sea anemone, to every beach. It is in or near the tropics that the most remarkable crabs are seen. During a visit to the islands off the coast of Texas, I once found a remarkable crab community. The islands were flat sandbanks just above the surface, blown and washed up by the sea, with here and there sand dunes and shrubs, and again vast stretches of sand inhabited only by crabs. The latter were all of one kind, a pale gray, so mimicking the sand in color that it was almost impossible to distinguish one from the other. There were legions of them. 
the sand in place being fairly riddled with their burrows, into which they darted with inconceivable rapidity. As I walked along the sands, they ran ahead in rapidly increasing numbers, then divided and were so quick of foot that it was impossible to run them down. This vast army of crabs was the sanitary cores of the island, devouring every dead fish that came ashore and other animal matter of all kinds. At Garden Key, Florida, these crabs were found in swarms, rarely entering the water except when driven, and never venturing far from the reach of the highest waves at high tide. They had long, stalked eyes, which seemed to follow every movement, and were very comical and interesting creatures to catch and study. On the keys covered with base cedars were other land crabs, colored rich red and purple. These crabs lived among cactuses and base cedar bushes. When climbing on the former, their resemblance in shape and color to the purple fruit was remarkable, and if the crab remained quiet, it was almost impossible to distinguish it. In these bushes a tern, the knotty, had built its rude brush nest, and the young bird and the food brought it by the parents were the objects of marked attention on the part of not only the purple-backed crab, but a hungry, starving horde of hermit crabs which climbed the tree and snatched the bits of fish from the young birds, despite the presence of their mother. By crawling beneath the thick brush in heat which was almost suffocating, I watched numbers of these foraging expeditions on the part of the crabs, and I think it possible that some of the larger crabs finally carried off the young birds. This was not an impossible feat, as Professor Mosley of the Challenger Deep Sea Dredging Expedition observed the same crab, or a very near relative, carry off young birds at St. Paul's Rocks. At Ascension he saw the doughty land crabs stealing young rabbits, dragging them from their holes by main force and devouring them. This crab with gorgeous colors was not very fleet of foot, and when I rose up suddenly in the cactus by a nest they would draw in their legs and cling to a branch, mimicking a ripe fruit. The hermits would do the same and fall to the ground in a shower. An interesting crab found here is known as grapsis, also a predatory creature with unequaled courage, preying upon every living thing that it can attack with safety. It is richly colored red and white, its legs are long, it is a racer along the sands, impossible to capture. On the West African coast, these crabs, or a near relative, are very large and so swift that they have been used in sport, horsemen following them at full speed as game. The ordinary crab of the eastern shore is highly valued, and vast numbers are shipped from Fort Monroe in Virginia to the northern cities. The trade in soft shells is even more important. The latter are caught in various ways. An old colored man of my acquaintance used to tread for them on the mud flats with his bare feet, but he confessed it was a disagreeable business as sometimes he stepped on hard shells by mistake and was badly bitten. The English edible crab is of large size and always in demand, resembling the edible crab of the Pacific, which is also very large and greatly esteemed. That these crabs have a strong homing sense or an affection for certain localities was demonstrated some years ago. Two crab fishermen were following their occupation from the same boat, and each as he caught a crab cut upon its swimming claw a private mark so that they could be claimed by the rightful owners at the end of the day. The boat was overtaken by a storm, and the crabs were tipped overboard five miles from where they were caught and lost. The following week the two men again began to fish in the original spot, and to their amazement began to catch the marked crabs, which had returned five miles along shore to the locality of their choice. The so-called green crab is an attractive and active creature, one that can easily be observed. Its quaint stalked eyes, which turn this way and that, and which can be stowed away in little depressions, and its singular method of walking are very interesting features. When a crab walks on land, it is usually endwise, and when it wishes to change its course, it is not obliged to turn about, but moves its legs in the opposite direction. It can also move directly ahead. These movements are all performed by six legs, which are pointed, the trail of this crab on the sand resembling pin marks on the hard beach. The two front claws are for tearing food and for general defense while the last pair, widened out at the end and some, are paddles by which the crab swims when it ventures off the bottom. At times the crabs appear to migrate. I have seen the bottom of a bay in the Virginian coast so covered that it was impossible to wade without stepping upon a crab. In the island of Jamaica, certain land crabs march to the sea to deposit their eggs, at which time they appear more or less indifferent to danger and move on despite the attacks of birds and various animals, including man. The crabs known as fiddlers are common up and down the Atlantic coast, especially in warmer spots. A most interesting colony lived north of Fernandina, Florida. 
Some years ago a plank walk led across their domain, and one could stand and watch their ludicrous maneuvers. The fiddler is not over an inch in length, it is of a dark ivory hue, and its eyes are perched on long stalks, so that it can bury itself in the mud and thrust its eyes upward, and thus in perfect safety observe everything that is going on. The right claw of this crab is half as long again as its entire body, a colossal weapon framed for an animal five or ten times its size. Indeed, it is so large it is almost useless, for a large amount of strength is required to operate so gigantic an implement. To emphasize the undue size of this claw, the left one is a dwarf, being too small to act as a defensive weapon. How so small a crab can use so strange a pair of weapons was a puzzle, until by watching them I discovered that the crab uses its large claw as a boogie, brandishing it fiercely, which gives it a ferocious appearance. The movement of the claw back and forth is called fiddling, hence the name of the crab, which appears to be constantly fiddling. Where hundreds are seen, all fiddling and menacing one another at the same time, the sight is laughable. Once while lifting branch coral into my boat on a coral reef, several crabs fell from the olive-hued mass, and like spiders and sheep in form, made their way slowly along. Each one was covered with a growth of seaweed. I took a brush and scoured them, producing veritable spider crabs. The body was pear-shaped, the claws were long and covered with sharp points. These crabs were placed in a tank and almost immediately began to replace the seaweed which had been rubbed off, evidently being much annoyed at the cleaning process. In redecorating themselves, they broke off small bits of seaweed from a branch, placed the broken portion against the mouth, evidently to attach some glutinous matter or animal mucilage, then raising it with an overhand movement, they attached it to the back. This was continually repeated until within a few hours the back of each crab was changed from a smooth surface to a miniature garden. As many times as the seaweed was removed, so many times it was replaced. The spider crabs range from the beautiful scarlet creatures found in the coral to the giant macrochyra of Japan, which in large specimens has a spread of legs of 20 feet, some measuring 22 feet between the two large biting claws, each of which is 10 and a half feet long. This huge crab is very slender and is slow of movement, its body resembling a rough rock. Crabs select singular places for homes. One lives in a sea cucumber, others live in corals, which appear to grow over them, forming a gall. The little oyster crab found in bivalves is a familiar form, but perhaps the most remarkable home for a crab was the bowl of an old tobacco pipe in which a crab I once owned ensconced itself. This was a hermit crab. The hermits differ from other crabs in having a long but soft and totally unprotected tail or abdomen, to preserve which they enter empty shells and drag them about wherever they go. The hermits occur in great variety, and there are marine hermits and land hermits. On the Florida reef they are found in myriads. Every shell along shore conceals a baby hermit, and almost every nook or cranny affords concealment for a score of them, their red and blue claws forming an attractive contrast to the shell. The hermit referred to was first found in a pearly shell and placed in the office, but finally it outgrew this and deserted it for the pipe which some workmen had left on the floor. Every day this old pipe would be clanked and dragged about the room, and once in a while the crab would drag it up a table leg, so reaching the tablecloth, and then the table top, where it drank out of a saucer left for the purpose. Later, a marine hermit was found in a pipe bowl, proudly dragging the grotesque house about. Anything of this kind would be used by the hermits. One was found in the opening of a spool, and this would roll over and over, carrying the hermit with it. Another took possession of a reed. Among deep-sea sponges, the hermits are seen occupying holes in the sponges. A community of hermits is a laughable sight. They are very pugilistic, and are always fighting. When a hermit outgrows its shell and begins to feel uncomfortable, it endeavors to turn out some comrade that has a larger shell, and in the battle arms and claws are often lost. This, however, is not serious as they grow again. When the hermit finds an empty shell, it thrusts in its claws and antennae, probing it in every direction to see that it is not occupied. When satisfied, it jerks itself out of its own shell, and with the greatest rapidity whisks its soft, unprotected body into the new house, where, if it fits, it remains. The shell, when large, is not carried, but dragged about, and when the crab is alarmed or startled, it darts backward into the shell, where its large claw and the others constitute almost as good a door as the real operculum of shells. The largest hermits are the marine forms, which enter the large conch shells and drag them about. 
These hermits are a brilliant red in color. Their claws are very tough. Closely related to the hermit crab is the famous coconut crab, or Burgos of the Spice Islands. This crab is so strong and powerful that, as Professor Van Beneden states, one clinging to a tree seized a small goat and lifted it from the ground by the ears. The Burgos resemble a huge hermit crab, but has no artificial shell, the soft abdomen being protected by its shell of its own. This large land crab lives mainly on coconuts, which it secures by climbing the trees and biting off the stems. Descending, the crab will take the nut and with remarkable discrimination, hold it with one claw and with the other tear off the husk, always at the end containing the eyes. This stripping process, impossible to man without some implement, is remarkable in itself and tells the story of the muscular strength of the crab. When the eyes of the nut are exposed, the crab seizes it by inserting its claw into the holes and hammers the shell until it is broken. The crabs live at the base of the trees and line their dens with the husk. In ancient times, crab-like creatures existed eight or nine feet in length. These are represented today by the quaint horseshoe or king crabs. They are found in shallow water in northern waters and resemble a horseshoe with a long, sharp spike or spine, the tail of this strange animal. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter Seventeen Luminous Crabs. One of the interesting experiences of Nordenskjold in the Arctic Ocean was wading through the sludge as the soft snow water along the beach is called and seeing each footprint turn into a mass of light, caused by the phosphorescence of a small crustacean called Metridia. The light was bluish-white, of great intensity, and although at times the cold was so severe that mercury would freeze, yet everywhere this marvelous light blazed. Even drops and splashes of the water seemed to be molten metal, but were merely alive with this minute light-giver resembling cyclops. In the Pacific, especially in summer, the exhibition of what might be called crab light is marvelous, and this is often true in the Atlantic. The light following the splash of an oar, the spray hurled aside by the cut water, the foaming water around a propeller, and the strange shifting specter which follows the rudder are caused more or less by minute crustaceans which have the faculty of emitting light without heat. Along the beach beneath seaweed we shall find Gamorous, a long, very small but mighty jumper that at night emits a red light. Many of the near relatives of this little creature are phosphorescent, and perhaps the most beautiful of all is one named Edotia phosphorea. It is a yellowish spotted little creature found in pools along shore. It darts about among the weed, and would rarely, if ever, be noticed among the day, but at night the entire animal seems permeated by a golden light which marks it in vivid lines against the dark bottom, and flashes in miniature meteors indicated as it dashes across the little pool, its ocean world. The most beautiful of all crustaceans is the one known as Safarina. I have seen the ocean filled with them, some red, others blue or yellow, purple or green, all known gems being imitated by these matchless gems of the sea, which in daylight vie with the most brilliant iridescence in producing wonderful displays. No more beautiful scene can be imagined than embracing these living gems standing out in brilliant tints against the deep blue of the ocean. These gems also have the gift of phosphorescence and at night appear in a new guise. One of the singular long-legged spider crabs of the deep sea, Colossendes, is said to be phosphorescent. Giglioni, the Italian naturalist, describes a crab which gives a golden purple light, the latter appearing from the thorax. The little shrimp mysis, which carries its young in a pouch, from which it is called the possum shrimp, is not phosphorescent but its young in which is called the zoeus stage are luminous. The odd-shaped little creature, which is the mantis shrimp in one of its stages, is brilliantly luminous, not over its entire body, but in the eye stalks. Some of the deep-sea crabs have luminous eyes, strange monsters wandering in the abysmal regions of the deep sea. While most of these crabs have the light in only one place, one discovered by Sir Joseph Banks was luminous over its entire surface. Exactly what the luminous matter is is not known, but in some instances it can be scraped off and will render the hands luminous when rubbed upon them. 
According to A. M. Norman, naturalist of the Porcupine Expedition, the crustacean Athusa, found at depth of 1,800 feet, is blind, its eye stalk being spiny and the eye replaced by a smooth, round termination, which is supposed to be a light-emitting organ. Aristius has phosphorescent eyes, which blaze with the yellow fire of a cat's eye, and this is true of many other crustaceans. Some have luminous backs, others have fiery bands upon the legs, while almost every portion of the body of some species is the seat of this wonderful light. That the lights are of some use, there can be little doubt. In one little creature, Dr. Gunther found a brilliant light station between its eyes, which certainly has a light to illuminate its way in the deep, dark bed of the ocean. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Parsons. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter Eighteen The Insects. Among the best known and attractive members of the lower animal kingdom are the insects, represented by the gorgeous butterflies, the iridescent beetles, the fierce spiders, and many others. The crustaceans may almost be called the insects of the ocean, as in general appearance they closely resemble these animals, but the real insects are higher forms. The skeleton of an insect is divided into three distinct parts instead of two. The head is distinct from the body, as in the crabs, and the skeleton, like that of the crabs, is external and formed of a horny substance called chitin. As in the crabs, the body is made up of rings or segments, four in the head generally, three in the thorax, and ten or eleven in the abdomen. It is interesting to glance at the various parts of insects, and later on, in reading about the many species, to note the many different purposes to which each is adapted. The mouth is a very complicated organ in the crabs, and equally so in the insects. It is generally separated into four distinct parts, the upper lip, labrum, the jaws, or mandibles, a second pair of jaws smaller than the above, and the lower lip, or jaws, labium. These are formed into sucking organs in the mosquito, biting organs in the ant, and tremendous graspers in the centipede, all displaying the most remarkable variety. The eyes of insects are wonderful organs, being both simple and compound. In the grasshopper, the two are easily seen, the compound eye being the larger. The fly has a remarkable compound eye, and in the center of the two eyes are three simple ones. The compound eye in the fly is made up of vast numbers of six-sided eyes crowded together, appearing under a glass like a honeycomb, yet each of these facets is a complete eye. In a sectional view of the eye of a beetle, we can see the nerve that reaches every one. In using the eyes, hundreds of images of the same object must reach the brain of the insect, yet the image of but one is seen. Attached to the head of insects are various sense organs, feelers or antennae, which are very ornamental, as in the beetles. The central portion of the skeleton bears the wings. In the beetle, the wing covers are formed of hard chitin. When its wings are not in use, this insect stores them away in covers provided for the purpose. The third or last part of the skeleton, the abdomen, often bears a weapon of defense, as a sting or a drill for boring holes in trees, or machines for making silk, as in the spiders. Here also we find a remarkable variety of tails, ranging from that of the dragonfly to the long tail of the scorpion with its dangerous sting or dagger. The feet of insects would make an interesting chapter alone, ranging from the curious, sucking, padded foot of the fly to the claws of others. The anatomy of insects is more or less complicated. The method of breathing is particularly interesting. 
it is very natural to imagine all animals breathing by the mouth or nostrils but insects breathe by a singular system of air tubes or trachea some having lungs as well the air tubes are wound with threads upon the inside this preserves their shape and keeps them open if we examine a grasshopper we shall see along the sides openings which under a powerful microscope resemble eye-like organs these are air holes windows or spiracles which lead to the air tubes and by minute thread-lined tubes reach all over the body to obtain air or to breathe the bee keeps its abdomen continually in motion forcing air through the body carrying oxygen to the blood tissues the insects with some exceptions deposit eggs and the young pass through many strange changes or metamorphoses before the full-grown form is attained the eggs of beetles hatch into larvae which may live weeks or months or even years in the ground the eggs of other insects as moths may become caterpillars which finally spin a cocoon as in the case of the silkworm and from this cell-like room appears the perfect moth these changes so infinite in their variety are among the most interesting features of insect life and are never failing sources of wonder and amazement on the part of those who devote time to the study end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of half hours with the lower animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elizabeth parsons half hours with the lower animals by charles holder chapter nineteen lower forms of insects in the previous chapter we have by the aid of illustrations glanced at the structure of insects and noted some of the features which distinguish them from the crabs now we may take up some of the more important and interesting groups and observe how nature has adapted them to their peculiar surroundings and for the various offices they fill in the world in examining the various families of insects it is interesting to note that many produce certain results or accomplish certain ends in totally different ways the highly organized spider by drawing silk from the spinning machines at the tip of its abdomen builds a web so strong that it sometimes captures birds i recently found a living hummingbird hard and fast in a web at the corner of my house and released it just in time to save it from the spider in the very lowest groups of insects we find the peripetus which spins a web-like structure from glands in its mouth ejecting the secretion at the insect it wishes to catch this appears to crystallize in the air and hold the victim despite its struggles the peripetus found in africa and central america resembles a large caterpillar having a long soft cylindrical body with many pairs of feet sometimes sixty-six the latter are soft and armed with claws it is remarkable for the possession of many legs but is outdone in this respect by the millipeds as some have as many as two hundred these insects when placed upon their backs present an extraordinary appearance clawing the air yet they are among the slowest of walkers they live in the ground are harmless feed on vegetable matter and deposit their eggs in the earth which hatch out little creatures at first resembling crickets the centipeds on the other hand are animal feeders and those found in the tropics are formidable creatures from six to ten inches in length supplied with many claws and terrible fangs they live a life of rapine and destruction and the appearance of a large specimen almost a foot in length dashing along with great rapidity by the aid of its fifteen or twenty pairs of feet is sufficient to demoralize the stroller through the dark glades of the tropical forests they have two pairs of foot jaws which grasp an enemy with wonderful tenacity the second pair is perforated and from it pours a poison dangerous to man in some tropical species and fatal to small animals 
several of these hideous creatures are luminous at times many centipeds have long antenna the eyes are very small and in groups the ordinary centiped of the north is harmless despite the tales related of its ferocity among the very small though destructive insects are the mites found in cheese and sugar they are parasitic in cattle and various other animals in california certain forms cling to the bushes in remarkable contrast to the round body mites are the scorpions in which the tail is sometimes two inches in length and armed with a sharp dagger-like sting provided with a poison apparatus the scorpions of the largest size are often found in the tropics in the same locality with centipeds under board piles and in dark places coming out at night to prey upon small insects which they seize with their crab-like claws and tear apart if the insect struggles violently the scorpion raises its tail over its back and pierces it with its dagger paralyzing it in striking at other enemies the scorpion whirls about keeping its tail toward them repeatedly striking down and using its jointed tail with marvelous ingenuity a few years ago these scorpions were common on the florida reef and were frequently killed in my own house at night the pain resulting from the sting was about as disagreeable as that occasioned by a wasp these scorpions were about three inches in length but in ceylon very much larger ones have been seen and known to catch birds the young scorpions are born alive and cling to the mother the little book scorpion the large whip scorpion and the daddy long legs or harvestmen a harmless and sociable insect are related to